Gotta find my Bible. morning to someone. We're going to be in Exodus 3, picking up where we had left off a few weeks back. So you'll remember we've had the setup. We've had uh, Israel's situation in Egypt. We've had uh, Moses saved. We've had, um, you know, by, by the way, little little connection. I don't think I mentioned that last time. I might have mentioned it a little bit, but being Epiphany Sunday today, and we were looking at, uh, you know, Herod killing all the baby boys and God saving him from Herod, bringing him down to Egypt. That's an intentional connection, right, to the story with Moses in, in multiple ways. Uh, that's the other time when a king... Pharaoh, Herod, are is murdering baby boy, baby Jewish boys, um, out of fear, right? And God preserves Moses and Jesus. You know, Moses is this type and this picture of Jesus, and uh, then God preserves Jesus by bringing him down to Egypt so that He can bring him back up. And as Matthew says, so that it would be fulfilled, out of Egypt I have called my son. So not only is Moses, you know, going to be a type of Christ, but the people of Israel being brought out of Egypt to Israel, that's going to be a type of Christ. Christ is going to be the fulfillment of that, the true son of God. You know, Israel, as we're going to see here, Israel is the son of God. God has made them his son uh, through this whole Exodus event, but they're a rebellious son. They're, they're a wicked son. They don't, they don't keep his commandments. Jesus will keep them perfectly for us. He'll be the Israel that Israel was supposed to be. All right, anyway, we'll, we'll go ahead with chapter three here, verses one through six. Now Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law Jethro. Um, I always read this, Jethro, and then you have to think of like Jethro Tull, even though I don't think I could even tell you a single song that that band played. But anyway, he's keeping the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian, and he led his flock to the west side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. He looked, and behold, the bush was burning, yet it was not consumed. And Moses said, I will turn aside to see this great sight. Why, the bush is not burned. When the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses. And he said, Here I am. And then he said, Do not come near. Take your sandals off your feet, for the place in which you are standing is holy ground. And he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. So a few notes here. First of all, Horeb, the mountain of God, that's Mount Sinai. As it'll mention later uh, in verse 12, he'll say, you will serve God on this mountain. That's a reference to when they'll come to Mount Sinai. Uh, it takes different names at different points. Uh, so you know, this mountain pops up a few times. You got here where Moses is seeing God. You got uh, Mount Sinai, of, uh, the giving of the law, of course. And then I think, pretty sure, that this is where Elijah goes when he runs for 40 days. And then he goes to, to Mount Horeb, to the mountain of God. Why is it called the mountain of God here? You know, I, I don't really know. Is this a place that God had kind of made a uh, kind of holy place to himself before this? Or is Moses calling it that because of what we'll find out about it later, right? By the time Moses is writing these things by inspiration, a lot of this has already happened. By the time he's writing it, the people who are reading it have already been to Mount Sinai. So he may be writing it like, yeah, you guys know this mountain that I'm at. It's the mountain of God. Even though I'm calling it Mount Horeb, it's the mountain of God where God gave the law. I don't know for sure. Anyway, notice that notice Moses' awe here. Of course, he has just seen something amazing. Yet, this is no less true. I mean, Moses has seen this burning bush, right? This is, this is an amazing thing. Like, I'm going to go and see this. So his so awe makes sense. But I want you to consider that this is no less true whenever we come to God's word. 
when we're here, when we gather in church to hear God's word and to receive the sacraments, we, we need to have this sense of awe. That doesn't necessarily mean you need to take off your shoes. I, I don't think a lot of people at church would appreciate that because how you show respect is a culturally conditioned thing. But the respect and the awe, there that's, that's the essence that we're looking for. It's worth noting that we as a culture are increasingly growing, you know, less respectful of things. We have less and less awe for anything. We don't respect much of anything except maybe celebrities or athletes, and we love to gossip about them. So we would do well to consider this and be warned. Be warned about our lack of respect and be introspective about it. I mean, are we going along? Are we going to go along with this trend in the church? Are we being tempted to be disrespectful, to be laid back, to be too casual about the word, about the preaching of the word, about the sacraments? Are our liturgical trends following along with the culture's trend to lack awe and respect? You know, I'd, I'd say that this is an argument if very much in favor of the historic liturgy. Let me tell you why. I, you know, we talked about this last week in the sermon that, that uh, things with regard to ceremonies in the church, they're a matter of Christian freedom, right? God didn't give us a commandment for how we should do this. Here he gives Moses a commandment to take off your sandals. He didn't tell us, this is how you shall show respect and, and cultivate a sense of awe and focus on the gospel in church. But those, are, those things are things that we should do. And, it's, and we have the freedom not to just say, hey, it doesn't matter, but the freedom to say, hey, what's the best way to do this? And here we go. Here we've got this thing, this historic liturgy with all that it entails with the church year and the, the pyramids, the pastor wears, and, and all these things that have been handed down to us from 40 generations of Christians. And there's a lot of wisdom in the way that it's been arranged to focus on Christ and to do so with a sense of awe. Like, church should be different. We don't want to come into church and then just feel like casual, like this is like anything else. You know, we don't want to come into church and feel like, ah, you know, it's just like a meeting at work. We don't want to come into the church and see the pastor, oh yeah, he just looks like a businessman. We don't want to come into church and say, yeah, this is just like going to, you know, what I, you know, what I would wear if I'm sitting at home lounging on my couch. Look, look. It's not a black and white thing in, in, in all of these terms. It's about the attitude and the reasoning, right? Um, you know, say some, take for instance with what we wear. Say that somebody gets off of work at a late shift and they come to church wearing their work clothes. Well, uh, they prioritize the hearing of the word. Who cares what they're wearing? But when we have the opportunity to kind of change our attitude by what we're wearing, or uh, by the way we decorate the church, or by the liturgy that we use, I think that's really important. We want our church building to be a sanctuary. We want it to be different. This is why I think it's important for the pastor to actually wear the robe, because it does set this thing off. It highlights this. This is something different. This is something that's interesting that's happening. Uh, kind of like Moses seeing that burning bush, and right, we want to have that sense of awe. And it's particularly important in the face of our culture, which is losing all such awe and respect. All right, let's look at verses 7 to 12. Then his sister said to Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and call you a nurse from the Hebrew women to nurse the child for you? And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Go. Oh, sorry, I'm in chapter 2. We're in chapter 3. I just looked and saw verse 7. We're in chapter 3, verse 7. I'll pick up there. Then the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt and have heard their cry because of their taskmasters. I know their sufferings, and I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey, to the place of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. And now, behold, the cry of the people of Israel has come to me, and I have also seen the oppression with which the Egyptians oppressed them. Come, I will send you to Pharaoh, that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt." But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? He said, But I will be with you, and this shall be the sign for you that I have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God on this mountain. All right. Notice what God's call to Moses is all about. It's all about God. Look what he says. I have heard. I have seen. I know their suffering. I have come to deliver them. I will send you. This is all about God. And look what Moses says. Who am I? Moses isn't getting this. 
God's thing was all I, 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 God. I, I've seen, I've heard, I will do this, I will send you. Moses' response is a complete non sequitur. Who am I, he says. God's like, who cares? I will be with you. He's saying to Moses, Moses, it doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter that you're a nobody. It doesn't matter what your weaknesses are. I am sending you, and I will be with you. This is a setup, uh, too, for the name that he's going to give. Moses has definitely been affected, I think, by his previous experience. You know, his fellow Israelites had basically said to him, who are you? And, and he was sort of humbled by that, but not necessarily in an entirely good way. So now he says, who am I? Moses might have been jumping the gun a little bit earlier. I'm not really sure, even though we said that we pointed out that Hebrews calls what he did before an act of faith. But that's kind of beside the point. Notice that true humility isn't about being down on yourself. It's about relying on God instead of yourself or instead of being distressed by yourself. Neither being full of yourself or down on yourself is actual humility. Just to be, to, humility is to be completely in God. And then you realize that indeed who you are doesn't matter because of who God is. It doesn't, like, like your strengths are not the point. God's are. And your weaknesses don't matter because of who God is. Verse 13 to 22. Then Moses said to God, if I come to the people of Israel and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask me, what is his name? What shall I say to them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, say to this people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, say this to the people of Israel, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever. And thus I am to be remembered throughout all generations. Go and gather the elders of Israel together and say to them, The Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, of Isaac, and of Jacob has appeared to me, saying, I have observed you and what has been done to you in Egypt, and I promise that I will bring you up out of the affliction of Egypt to the land of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, and the Hivites, and the Jebusites, a land flowing with milk and honey. And they will listen to your voice, and you and the elders of Israel shall go to the king of Egypt and say to him, The Lord, the God of the Hebrews, has met with us, and now please let us go a three days' journey into the wilderness, that we may sacrifice to the Lord our God. But I know that the king of Egypt will not let you go unless compelled by a mighty hand. So I will stretch out my hand and strike Egypt with all the wonders that I will do in it. After that, he will let you go. And I will give this people favor in the sight of the Egyptians. And when you go, you shall not go empty. But each woman shall ask of her neighbor and any woman who lives in her house for silver and gold, jewelry, and for clothing. You shall put them on your sons and on your daughters. So you shall plunder the Egyptians. Moses' question to God here is a little bit weird. Like, he's saying, okay, if I go to them and I say, the God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask me, what's his name? What shall I say? Like, I think that's a little bit of a weird question. Like, have they forgotten who the God of their fathers is? Maybe. Yahweh means, I am who I am. In contrast to the gods of Egypt and to men that change, in contrast to who we are, small and failing and changing, in contrast to all that Moses is not, God is who he is. He is the I am. Men fail both when they change and when they do not. Sometimes we refuse to change. We refuse to give up those bad habits. Refuse to change for the benefit of others because we're stubborn and we are who we are. We're not going to change for anyone. We refuse to admit when we're wrong. In other ways, we change all the time. And usually those ways are the ways in which we shouldn't change. We might lose our optimism about something. We might become acclimated to something to the point where we take it for granted. We might, um, you know, uh, like what... I mean, acclimated to like a relationship with a spouse, a friend, or children, and 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 take it for granted, and not treasure it, and not and not uh, rejoice in it the way we did before. You know, we we change in all kinds of bad ways, and don't change in all the worst ways. So God gives Moses this name of the unchanging God, the God who is perfect and does not change, the God who is everything that we are not, and He gives this great promise to speak to them that he knows their suffering, that he is the God who made great promises to their fathers, that he will not only bring them out 
But first, he will show the greatness of his power and cause the Egyptians to beg them to go. I mean, look what he's saying. He's saying they're not just going to let you leave. They're going to be so eager for you to leave that they're going to give you their gold and their jewelry, and they're going to come out with all their riches. They're going to plunder Egypt. By the way, this too has a connection to Epiphany. And we read earlier from Isaiah 60, that prophecy about Epiphany, about the wise men coming, that those, those wise men are a, a, a picture of the New Testament church in a lot of ways. So here you have the children of Israel coming from Egypt to Israel, and they're going to take the wealth of Egypt with them. When the wise men come, they, they're bringing this wealth, these gifts that they give. Okay? That was prophesied in the Old Testament. And in Isaiah, it talks about how, you know, the wealth of the nations is going to be brought to you, Israel. When it says, Arise, shine, for your light is coming. It's talking to Israel. Your light, your glory, the glory of the Lord has risen upon you, and it's reflecting off of you. And this light, this light of the glory of the Lord of Jesus Christ shining on you is going to reflect off of you to the world, and the world's going to come. It's talking about the nations, the Gentiles, through the gospel being brought into the church of God. And when that happens, the wealth of the nations is going to come to them. It's like the church is going to plunder the nations. Meaning, you know, the, the, it's talking about offerings that, that we give. It's talking about uh, ourselves, right, being brought into the people of God. All of that's there. And, and you have this kind of picture of that, too, in uh, Egypt, giving all of their gifts to the Israelites when they will leave. So, you know, God gives Moses this great promise and this great name. And, of course, as we know as well with that name, I am, you want to connect that with the New Testament, especially with the Gospel of John. Uh, John, this is one of John's major themes. He's highlighting the fact that Jesus is the I am. John especially, all the Gospel writers emphasize that Jesus is true God. But in some ways, John wants to do this especially blatantly because of some of the false teaching that was going on of the time that he wrote his gospel. And one of the most blatant ways he does that is with those I am statements. Both the, the statements themselves, you know, like I am the good shepherd. Well, that phrase, the good shepherd, that's a claim to be God. But then also just the, the wording I am. I am. That's me. That one from Exodus. And the most blatant example is when he says before Abraham was, I am. I am Yahweh. And of course, it's there in his name, as we mentioned last week in our sermon too. Jesus means I am saves. That's who he is. He is the I am God who saves. All right, chapter 4, verses 1 through 9. Then Moses answered, But behold, they will not believe me or listen to my voice, for they will say, The Lord did not appear to you. The Lord said to him, What is that in your hand? He said, A staff. And he said, Throw it on the ground. So he threw it on the ground, and it became a serpent. And Moses ran from it. But the Lord said to Moses, Put out your hand and catch it by the tail. So he put out his hand and caught it, and it became a staff in his hand. That they may believe that the Lord, the God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has appeared to you. Again, the Lord said to him, Put your hand inside your cloak. And he put his hand inside his cloak, and when he took it out, behold, his hand was leprous like snow. Then God said, Put your hand back inside your cloak. So he put his hand back inside his cloak. And when he took it out, behold, it was restored like the rest of his flesh. If they will not believe you, God said, or listen to the first sign, they may believe the latter sign. If they will not believe even these two signs, or listen to your voice, you shall take some water from the Nile and pour it on the dry ground, and the water that you shall take from the Nile will become blood on the dry ground. All right, so um, we've already had one objection from Moses, right? He's like, he's like, who am I? And God's like, it doesn't matter who you are, I am. And then Moses' second objection to this great word is, well, they won't believe me. Remember what God said? Uh, later, Jesus said, Jesus said, a wicked and adulterous generation seeks after a sign. Yet, God also at times offers signs freely. Sometimes he offers these signs, which we shouldn't need, but he gives them anyway to deal with us in our weakness. And at other times, he refuses to give signs. So in this instance, he's saying, here's some signs to give them. And uh, they're going to ask for them when this happens. Yet, he, God in grace offers multiple signs. I think he knows that the spirit of this people is broken. He knows how weak they are, and he seeks to take them by the hand and help them in their weakness, because that's the kind of God our God is. And it's important for us to remember, remember that too, you know, when we're dealing with um, you know, people who, who we're witnessing to, with uh, weak, weak brothers and sisters in the, in the congregation, we want, to, we want to deal with them in that same sort of patience 
uh, in that same sort of understanding and love. And it's also the same thing that God is doing with Moses. Moses keeps making these excuses, and God is dealing with him very patiently. Verses 10 through 12, the next excuse. But Moses said to the Lord, Oh, my Lord, I am not eloquent, either in the past or since you have spoken to your servant, but I am slow of speech and of tongue. Then the Lord said to him, Who has made man's mouth? Who makes him mute or deaf or seeing or blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Now, therefore, go, and I will be with your mouth and teach you what you shall speak. All right, Moses' next excuse is, well, I'm not a good speaker, right? God's like, who do you think I am? Who made the mouth? Besides, he says, I'll tell you what to say. You know, that's an important reminder, too, for us, for uh, pastors, for uh, teachers, for Sunday school teachers, for parents, for uh, friends, in any opportunity that we have to preach the word. This idea, and it's so common, like, oh, I'm not really good at speaking. Who cares? It's not about your eloquence. It's not about you witnessing to somebody isn't about you figuring out just the right words to say. It's not about you organizing everything in just the right method, right? It's about God's word. God's saying, I'll give you the words to speak. He's talking about, for us, that's, it, that's, it, that's in the Bible. We've got, we've got those words. You know, that, that's our focus. We just want to give people the word of God. Luther used to say something like, he has great quotes about this, he would say, you know, on Sunday, he's talking about Sunday preaching, he's like, I stand up, I speak up, I shut up, then I go home and I let the Holy Spirit do his work. He's like, it's just about preaching the word. He also said, another one that's like that, he's like, I did nothing. The word did everything. I preached, I wrote, etc. The word did everything. And that's true. It's God's word which has the power. And the power of the word isn't in eloquence. Look, that doesn't mean that, like, as a pastor, for instance, we, we should use that as an excuse not to strive to uh, preach in a good and logical and eloquent way, or that as individuals we shouldn't strive to present the word in the best way that we can. But ultimately, the power of the word isn't in those things. It's in the word itself, the word of law and gospel. Verses 13 through 17. But he said, Oh, my Lord, please send someone else. Then the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses. And he said, Is there not Aaron, your brother, the Levite? I know that he can speak well. Behold, he is coming out to meet you. And when he sees you, he will be glad in his heart. You shall speak to him and put the words in his mouth. And I will be with your mouth and with his mouth and will teach you both what to do. He shall speak for you to the people and he shall be your mouth and you shall be as God to him. And take in your hand the staff with which you shall do the signs. <laughs> no more excuses now. Moses has run out. God's answered them all. And now he just says, I don't want to. And that's when God gets angry. Not me, Moses has sent someone else. How often do we have the same attitude? I don't want to be the one that tells that person about the gospel. It seems too awkward to send someone else. I don't want to be the person to love my homeless neighbor by helping them. I've got my own problems. Send someone else. I don't want to be the one to warn my friend about that sin that he or she is getting involved in. I, he might not like me. Send someone else. The list goes on. And a lot of times we, we have all these reasons, these excuses for things that we don't want to do because uh, they're uncomfortable to us. And we can think of a thousand excuses, but ultimately it's not about the excuses. It's just about our unwilling attitude. And uh, we need to you know, kind of get a swat from God when that's the case. Um, and uh, so he does here. With, he, finally get, he finally gets angry at Moses now. But he's also still patient with him. He says, here comes Aaron. You, know, you, you don't want to speak? You're, you think you're not a good speaker? He can speak for you. I'll tell you what to say. You tell him what to say. I'll be God to you. You be God to him. I'll do the signs. You can do the signs. He can do the signs. You guys can be a team. Here he comes. I've sent him to you. Now, um, lost my spot there a little bit. Where to go here? Oh, okay. Notice something else about this too. God does not directly call us the way that He called Moses. I mean, this is this is what we call scripturally speaking a direct call, immediate. Meaning, God is speaking directly to Moses and telling him, I'm calling you to do this. Uh, the apostles are called in the same way. Most of them. One of the apostles was called immediately. Meaning, through a mediator. God's still calling, but he's doing it through somebody. That is uh, uh, Matthias. Matthias is call is still from God. The apostles realized God wanted them to call another apostle. And uh, they realized that it was the Holy Spirit who was going to select him through them. But it wasn't Jesus or God or the Holy Spirit just saying, hey, yeah, him. 
Now, earlier, when uh, there's another account in the book of Acts, when the Holy Spirit speaks like directly to the congregation of believers and tells them to send Paul and Barnabas on this mission trip. That's, that's also a direct call, an, an immediate call, not immediate call. So Moses' called here is direct. That's true of basically all the prophets in the Old Testament, right? Uh, we talk about the divine call. It's probably a good time to bring this up because, you know, I just, uh, um, we just had that kind of going on here with, uh, I had that call to Cheyenne and I just returned it. So how does that work? We talk about the divine call uh, to, into the pastoral ministry or for a teacher. So a few things. Uh, a divine call in the New Testament church is going to be a call from a gathering of believers for the gospel ministry. So God's instituted the preaching of the word and the administration of the sacraments. He's also made it quite clear that um, what's not in the New Testament, it's his desire for every group of believers to call a man or men to do that, right? We call that the office of the pastor. That doesn't mean that the pastor has to be the one who does that in every way. There's, there's freedom here. The, the, the necessary thing is the preaching of the word and the administration of the sacraments. And there are aspects of that that um, I'm getting into a little bit more detail than I intended on here, but that's okay. So there are aspects of that that you need somebody who is qualified for a great for for more things in order to do. So for instance, anybody can you know read through the liturgy and speak the words of institution, for instance, and hand people the bread and the wine. And it's it's the sacrament. The pastor doesn't have some special power. But in general, the practice of the church has been that the supper should actually only be administered. I'm not talking about who's actually holding the stuff, right? Should be overseen by the pastor of that congregation. And there's a reason for this. It's not because the pastor has some special power or because somebody else can't do it. It's because the pastor, part, part of giving the Lord's Supper to people is an exercise of spiritual oversight, right? Like he's been called to watch out for their souls. The Bible talks about this. You know, these, these are they who have been called to watch out for your souls, right? So he needs to be qualified to be able to do that. And he needs to be called to do that. The Bible talks about both those things. Those are the things that are necessary. Uh, the person needs to be qualified to be, to be able to teach and preach the word, to be able to oversee people's souls, to be able to convict and rebuke and exhort and, and to have like the doctrine correct and all, all of those things. He needs to be able to do those things uh, if he's going to be the person who's overseeing the giving of the Lord's Supper. Okay. And, and uh, anyway, that's all involved in that. So that's the pastoral office. But we also have we're all we also have the freedom to make other offices, and as long as they are they involve preaching the gospel, we still that's still a divine call. So when we call a Christian day school teacher to a congregation, one of the things that we're asking that person to do is to teach the gospel to the children of the congregation. When we ask that person to teach math to the children of the congregation, uh, that's not that's that part of it's not a divine call. That's not that's I mean they're still serving God in that it's still a vocation, but it's not a divine call because it isn't uh, a part of the preaching ministry. But when we're calling them to preach the gospel in teaching Bible history lessons and hymnology etc., that's that's the gospel ministry and that's why that's a divine call. Same thing with like a Sunday school teacher calling a Sunday school teacher to preach the gospel to children. That's part of the gospel ministry. That's a divine call. However, uh, when you sign up for the church cleaning schedule or to mow the lawn, well, we're serving together. We're serving the Lord, showing our faith. It's not a divine call. You're not, you're not preaching the gospel by mowing the lawn, right? It, it's part of the body of believers working together, having this fellowship of preaching the gospel through the called pastor, but it, it's not a divine call. That's what that difference is. And uh, those are immediate, okay? So now when we have, you're calling a pastor, it's immediate call. Not like Moses, God's calling Moses directly, but God's doing this through believers. And we have this process outlined in the New Testament. 
come. Uh, we do this for teachers, for missionaries, for, for professors, for, for pastors, where the, the body of believers, this way we do it in our, in our city, the group of voters who represent the congregation, they're uh, calling up somebody who's a qualified individual to that gospel ministry, and we know that the Bible talks about how the Holy Spirit's doing that through us, right? Uh, we have a passage in Acts talking about how it was talking about a situation where a broad body of believers had prayed and picked qualified candidates and called somebody, and then Paul says, the Holy Spirit made you overseers. That's not the only way of doing it, though. You know, other church bodies, like, for instance, take the uh, Catholic Church's system. They have uh, uh, what's called, like, an Episcopal system. There's, you know, bishops. It's a hierarchical system. And the people who choose... Which priests are going to be where are, you know, like bishops and stuff. I don't know all the details, but right, they're like higher up people. And some Lutheran synods do it the same way. And that's fine. It might not be the best way. We don't particularly think it's the best way. Um, but it's fine. It's still Christians choosing pastors to go and serve those congregations. And because it's still Christians who are doing that, uh, they have that authority from the Lord, Christians to do that. And so it's still, it's a divine call, right? And the Lord's using that. Anyway, so here with Moses, again, we have this direct call. And in, in contrast to that, we have that divine call, but then we also have our vocations. So you're just talking about the way this kind of applies to us. If you're somebody with a divine call, pastor, teacher, Sunday school teacher, you know, think about the story with Moses. God's calling you to do this work. Who you are doesn't matter. Who God is matters. That's what's important. And, and also with our vocations. Uh, while we have these direct divine calls or in, uh, immediate divine calls, our vocations are also a call from God in a different sort of way. You know, all of these things, God calls us in a general way, the same general way that he calls all of his believers to be his disciples and to be priests. That's what we thought mean, we mean the priesthood of all believers. He gives to each of us the same call to share the gospel and to show his love. He calls us to do this in everything that we are and in, in a general way to each neighbor, to any person that we come into contact with. And then uh, he also has us in particular ways, right? Like um, he calls us to do this as parents, as siblings, as spouses, as children, in our jobs. And in all of these things, we have that general call as part of the priesthood of all believers to share the gospel and to show his love. So whenever you're talking about one of these ways in which God has called you, whatever it takes to fulfill that call, stop with the excuses. We're so used to those excuses like Moses. Who am I? Well, it's irrelevant because of who God is. They won't listen to me. It's irrelevant because God has given you his word and you can rest in, in his hand. And I don't know how to speak. It's irrelevant because the power is in the word. I don't want to. It's stupid. There's an expression. God doesn't call the qualified. He qualifies the called. Here's something for you to think about here for a second. We, we're not really interactive here, so I can't have you tell me your thoughts. But uh, in which ways might that be true? And in which ways might that not be true? I'll say it again. God doesn't call the qualified. He qualifies the called. In which ways is that true? And in which ways is that not true? Well, think about that first thing. God doesn't call the qualified. That's true. The people that God calls to serve him, they're not qualified for the work in the sense of being like worthy of it or perfect in other senses uh, he is calling people that are qualified right like i could see somebody using this as an excuse to just call anyone as a pastor this is becoming more common in sort of mega church evangelical circles to be like oh look at this guy over here you know he's got he's like a really he's like a really charismatic speaker he should be a pastor well okay he's a charismatic speaker that's great is he trained in the doctrine you know has he gone to college and seminary can he uh, rebuke? Can he rebu rebu rebuke those who are teaching false doctrine? Can he convict those who are living in sin? Can he confront them with the word? Can he teach the children? Can he, can he preach sound doctrine? Did, yeah, right? Having an ability to speak does not make one qualified to be a pastor. And God does make it clear that he, he, wants, to, he wants to 
He wants us to call people who are qualified. But at the same time, no one's qualified. Paul writes in 2 Corinthians, like, who is sufficient for these things? When, when we as pastors, or if you're a Sunday school teacher, or teacher, missionary, when we, when we consider the work that God has given us to do, when we consider our own weaknesses, our laziness, our, our lack of focus, our, our selfishness, all of these things, we are not qualified for any of this. We are not worthy of any of this. But God says, it doesn't matter who you are, because I am. So what about that other phrase? He, he qualifies the called. That's certainly true. So the, the first part was partially true and partially not true. God doesn't call, call the qualified. It, it depends on the way you're using it. If you're using it in the sense that none of us are worthy, it's a good, it's a good saying. If you're using it in the sense that, well, it doesn't really matter you know, whether you uh, have been trained in the doctrine, you could be a pastor. That's not the point. The second half of it, he qualifies the called. That's absolutely true. Whatever work God calls you to do, right? If, if you're called to be a pastor, if you're called to be a teacher, our, our individual general calling as Christians and disciples in our, you know, if you're a father, you're called to be a father. It's really easy. You want to know what you're, what you're called to do? Well, look at your life. Look at your position. Look at, the, the, look at the people that God has put in your life, the people that he's given you to care for, the people that he's given you authority over, the people he's called you to serve, right? This is what you, these are the only questions you've got to ask yourself. Who, who is there in my life whom God has called me to love and care for? Who is there in my life that God has given me authority over? You know, to teach his word to, to, to care for them, to help them. Who in my life has God called me to be obedient to? These are all callings that he has given you, right? So, like, you're a citizen. You, have, you owe a certain level of obedience to the government. You are a, if you're a brother or a sister, you owe a certain level of care to your siblings. If you're a child, you, you owe something to your parents, right? Fourth commandment, right? If you're a father or a mother, you have a responsibility towards your children. If you're an employer, you have a responsibility towards your boss. These are all ways in which God is calling you to serve him. And when you do that, remember, take comfort and confidence in the fact that God does indeed qualify the called. The work that he's calling you to do, he's not just hanging you out there to dry. He's not like, yeah, you know, go figure it out on your own. Find your own strength. That's not the way he works. He gives grace. Pray. If you need, if you need patience as a parent, pray for it. What does James say? You do not have because you do not ask. And pray confidently. These gifts of the Spirit, love, joy, patience, peace, kindness, goodness, understanding, self-control, humility, boldness to speak the word, God promises to give you these things. Ask for them again and again and again and again and again and again and go into his word to find them, right? He qualifies the called. He wants us to grab hold of those things by faith. He qualifies us. He does. But to, to do the work that he has given to us to do. Verses 18 to 23, chapter 4. Moses went back to Jethro, his father-in-law, and said to him, Please let me go back to my brothers in Egypt to see whether they are still alive. And Jethro said to Moses, Go in peace. And the Lord said to Moses and Midian, Go back to Egypt, for all the men who were seeking your life are dead. So Moses took his wife and his sons and had them ride on a donkey and went back to the land of Egypt. And Moses took the staff of God in his hand. By the way, that's another connection to that epiphany story. Jesus flees to Egypt. When Herod dies, God's like, go back. The people who are seeking your life are dead. Moses also is rescued from the king that's killing babies. Then eventually he runs away later for like a different reason. And then when, he, when that Pharaoh is dead, God says, go back. People who sought your life are, de are, are dead. And the Lord said to Moses, when you go back to Egypt, see that you do before Pharaoh all the miracles that I have put in your power. But I will harden his heart so that he will not let the people go. Then you shall say to Pharaoh, thus says the Lord, Israel is my firstborn son. And I say to you, let my son go that he may serve me. If you refuse to let him go, behold, I will kill your firstborn son. God sees the shape of all these things. He knows what's going to happen. He knows the hardness of Pharaoh's heart. He knows that Pharaoh will refuse to let his people go. And as a result, in judgment, God himself will harden Pharaoh's heart in order to uh, basically magnify his power and glory so that the Egyptians and the Israelites will see even more of God's power in those plagues and culminating in the Passover. That's why he says, you know, I will kill your firstborn son. That's what's going to happen in the Passover. But this is also all a shadow of Christ. God's true firstborn son, whom God himself will kill in order to redeem you to be his sons. Verses 24 to 26. 
At a lodging place on the way, the Lord met him and sought to put him to death. Then Zipporah, that's his wife, took a flint and cut off her son's foreskin and touched Moses' feet with it and said, Surely you are a bridegroom of blood to me. So he let him alone. It was then that she said, A bridegroom of blood because of the circumcision. That's probably a story you didn't hear in Sunday school. A little bit unusual. Moses apparently hadn't, I don't know if he hadn't told her about circumcision. I don't, I don't know why he hadn't circumcised his son. Was he bowing to cultural norms of this other place? I have no idea. Uh, it brought some, almost caused like a bunch of trouble. And then Zipporah realizes what's going on, and she cuts out her son's foreskin and throws it at Moses, right? Like, you're a bridegroom of blood to me. You almost brought this blood upon me. So you see kind of this, you know, God sent Moses, and this sort of reminder to him of, of the terror of disobeying God, and of the awe, again, that, that we should have towards God and who he is. Verses 27 to 31. The Lord said to Aaron, Go into the wilderness to meet Moses. So he went and met him at the mountain of God and kissed him. And Moses told Aaron all the words of the Lord with which he had sent him to speak and all the signs that he had commanded him to do. Then Moses and Aaron went and gathered together all the elders of the people of Israel. Aaron spoke all the words that the Lord had spoken to Moses and did the signs in the sight of the people. And the people believed. And when they heard that the Lord had visited the people of Israel and that he had seen their affliction, they bowed their heads and worshipped. They believed and they worshipped. And that's the setup for the next chapter. That faith and that worship isn't going to last very long, but it's there now. All right, um, that's all we got for today. We'll pick it up next week with Exodus 5. Uh, so the grace of our Lord Jesus be with each of you.